Hey, Professor Glenn, my name is Brian Alexander. Um, here we're going to be starting my final project and the five things that I learned and really stood out to me and implicit biases that I had. So first I want to start with spanking is necessary to train, to train children. Um, this is something that I grew up with that I thought was kind of the only route because that's the only thing I really got as a kid. Um, quick background, I grew up in a single parent household, uh, military household, uh, single father, um, and he was a military guy and that was kind of the number one go-to punishment. He would do a little bit of restriction and stuff like that, but that was all I really kind of saw and I see how I turned out and how I act in society and then how other kids that I know weren't necessarily um, spanked and stuff like that act out. It felt like growing up I could always tell you knew if a kid was spanked or not by how they how they act. Um, but I think that moving into my generation and the generations coming, you know, the science is out there, we're really starting to see different outlooks and different ways of, um, you know, punishing and really training and teaching children. Um, but I think the biggest key of why that misconception is out there, that spanking is the only alternative, is because it's what they saw. Um, you know, I remember hearing growing up all the time, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, you know, it's, it's the only thing that our parents really knew because the generation before them, everyone, every kid in my generation gets the example, oh, this is nothing what my parents did to me. And so I think it's just a continuation of that's all people have really known. Um, and it was just continuing and continuing until finally someone was like, hey, we need to make a change on this. St test started getting done. Um, but as my article list, it's, you know, a lot of parents seem to do this out of desperation, that nothing else seems to work. Um, they don't have a consistent discipline strategies like the ones that we've learned on our lectures. Um, I feel like spanking is just the best option because, you know, it's quick. They can do it right then and there. It knows it makes they make the child upset. And it's kind of like when you raise your dog. You know, you spank your dog, um, put your head in the urine or anything when they're doing the bathroom, and the dog learns. But instead of doing that, you know, with children, we need to be moving it into those other practices and stuff, making the child take a step back and really understanding what they did, how it can affect them in the long run. Um, and so, and a lot of times parents will give up on the different techniques that we learned about. They'll think, this isn't working right away, I gotta have something fast, so spanking is there. And then it just becomes habitual and stuff like that. But we can see now that kids respond a lot better to different types of less physical punishment. Um, you know, sitting in the corner, um, taking stuff away, making them realize what they did. We're starting to see a lot more out of that. And that was new for me to learn because Growing up, I've always said, I was like, I'm going to spank my kids when I get there. And now it's kind of like, well, I can still remember a lot of my spankings growing up. I don't know if it'll be, really be worth doing that to my kids. Um, so I think that's definitely going to make me take a different outlook on kids in the future. Uh, my second point is there's more hardship in single parent families. Um, I always grew up thinking that you know, I had it so much harder because I only had one parent because unfortunately when I was six, my mom chose a different life while my dad was in the middle of Iraq. He had to come home and take care of me. And so I always kind of had that feeling like, man, I wish I had more here. And it really took me getting older and then seeing this class and different things that we learned. Um, it's not just about having those two parents. You can have both parents and one of them just really not be there supportive and good for you and there mentally for you. And a lot of times I think what we do see is when it's not good for the children's is when it's a really bad divorce or the parents are talking bad about one another. Instead of co-parenting and bringing that child together, they make it personal about them instead of really taking the child into consideration. Um, but what it really comes down to is just that remaining parent that's there as that head figure. If we can't get a good co-parenting, let's just let's say that one child is completely, I mean, I'm sorry, one parent is just completely gone out of the picture then it doesn't come down to, and what I had to learn too, it doesn't come down to, you know, having those with parents. It matters how strong of a house that single parent can have and can make for the child, um, how resilient that parent is to be positive, resourceful, um, you know, getting that child engaged with other parents. I know one thing that my dad always did was, looking back on it now, of course, I never thought any of this until this class kind of really broke it down, but my dad always had me around friends that had their mother and stuff like that. And he made sure to put me around a lot of women in my life to be mother figures to really set that role up. And so 
I definitely noticed going into my early adulthood and stuff, I was like, Mother's Day would come around, and as a kid, I'd be sad. I'd be like, well, I don't talk to mine. And as I got older and more into adulthood, I was like, I do have mothers. I have all these women around me that have raised me and helped my dad out and, you know, given me what it feels like to be or to have a real mother. Um, but I definitely came into this class still. It's still going to be in the back of your mind that, you know, single parent families have it so much harder, which don't get me wrong. They have a lot more work to do. Um, not having that other parent there to help them out, but it's not always a bad thing for the child. Um, and I guess this class made me look at it like I really wouldn't have changed what happened in my, in my dad's situation. I think that there's a lot more hardship because I didn't have a mom to go to and stuff like that. So when we would get into arguments and stuff, it was just me and him mad at each other. There was nobody to mediate it. But looking at it now, like I had a very comfortable growing up. Um, it, my dad did an awesome job. We're as close as can be now. Um, in this class and just the different articles that really made me look at it like it only matters about that one parent you don't have to have both parents granted that's the ideal situation but if one parent decides to step out that one parent can still give that child just as good of a childhood as a two-parent household so for my next point I want to go into most women are the single parents um, so this one is kind of weird for me because we can look at the statistics that are in my pewresearch.org um, article right here, um, and we've seen different changes on times and stuff. So in 1968, 88% of single parents were women, and only 12% there were solo dads, which is what I always believed, um, and I feel like that's kind of been a known thing. Um, but And then so, you know, the next one we'll see is in 1997, 68% of solo moms. And now there are also 12% of, so, of solo dads. But then we see a 10% of cohabiting moms and 10% cohabiting dads. So then we come all the way up to 2017, only 53% of single parents are female. And then we still have that 12% of solo dads. But then now we've moved up into a 17% of cohabiting dads and an 18% of cohabiting moms. So that gives us that extra 35% of, of unmarried parents are now cohabiting. So with this, we kind of see that those numbers have definitely changed, um, but that 12% really stood out to me a lot just because you, you never saw other dads. Like I felt like I was the only one in my scenario because um, my dad didn't really date growing up or anything like that. It was just it was me and him. He just wanted to make sure that I was raised right, which really brings back that last point of making a single-parent household, you know, still a strong, good environment. Um, but we're seeing now that it is more normal for those parents to be cohabiting. Um, but so we're only seeing 53% are solo moms. So that other 47% is now solo dads or cohabiting families taking care of the children because there's a 17% of cohabiting dads and 18% of cohabiting moms. So that's very close making up that last piece. Of course, with that 12%, it's still that solo dads. Um, so it, you can definitely see as time has changed that there are, um, you know, changes coming because, I mean, women starting out in 1968 of 88% bringing up the solo family households. We didn't see the cohabiting back then. Um, but women were definitely doing it 90% of the time, just about 90% of the time, 88% to be in, to be true. But it just interested me a lot to see because I, you really, when you grow up in that single dad family, it kind of feels like you're the oddball out. Um, cause you don't really see a lot of other families that, you know, it's single dads. Most of the time it is that mom, um, that is there taking care of the child and stuff. So this one, this was just something that. I was able to look at through a different view going through the class and the different research and stuff. It's like, okay, A, there is other people going through this, and then B, we are changing into that um, unmar unmarried parents are cohabiting and stuff. So people are growing back together, um, and it's just only 53% of that that are doing solo moms. That dad rate has stayed the same, but at least the solo moms rate was able to come down. 
And for my fourth point, it's going to be solitude is not always the best option for mental health. Um, this relates to me personally. Um, I'm a, I've done six years in military service, two in active duty, and um, four in the National Guard. I'm still in the Guard currently. But this one really hits home. Um, I'm also treated by the VA for some mental health stuff. Um, but I've always felt that solitude was the best option. I thought that, you know, I, I was raised being, you just need to go by yourself, breathe, think, you know, when you get in trouble, go to your room, be by yourself, think about what you've done. Um, and so I think growing up that I just had instilled in my head, I need to go be alone. If something's wrong or I've got something bad on my mind, I need to go be alone. I need to go think it, think about it and not have any distractions. I'm sorry, my dog is messing with me. Randy, go lay down. So it really took me a long time of taking these different psychology courses to understand how that's not always the best option. Um, it took me a long time to be able to go out and do things. I have panic disorder is basically what I'm treated for through the VA. Um, and I always felt safe at home and when I was alone, um, it made me not want to go out. And so home became my safe space. Well, when you're home and not having any contact with anything, you'll sit there and I'll be like, okay, fine. I'm just going to sit at home and drink. I'll unwind or, you know, release this anxiety, get rid of it. Um, and that's really not the best case that we can do. Um, being a veteran, I know I'm added to a different poll. But the National Alliance of Mental Illness has already released that more than 10% of college students have been diagnosed with depression. Um, and it's, it's an increasing issue. Um, you know, solitude can be a positive thing and shouldn't always be regarded as a bad thing. Uh, but too much of it, um, actually, in the research, it shows it can raise your, your blood pressure and also increase your hormones, making you react way differently. Um, too many hormones of any type can be very negative and not allow you to think. Plus, you're getting that high blood pressure, and anything done with the heart is never good. Um, but it's not always a bad thing, luckily. In the research, it does say, um, you know, solitude has gotten... It's usually looked at if it's really bad. If somebody's alone um, or likes to be alone, they're usually a social min misfit. Um, but... Then on the other hand, learning to be alone is a skill, and it can be refreshing and restorative. And that's where I, this was the one that I'm really on the boat about um, because it's kind of one of those you've got to find that happy medium because I still like to have my solitude. After a long day, I like to come home. I like to drink a beer, um, you know, play video games, watch a movie sometimes. But I've noticed, um, especially holiday season, um, you know, over the past couple of years, I've been sick or I couldn't go visit my family because they were sick and then everyone was out of town, so I didn't have anybody to do anything with, didn't have practice or anything like that. Um, and so I found myself just constantly, you know, waking up, drinking till I passed out, going back to sleep because I just didn't want to face that day. Um, and that was also before I reached out to get help and to find a therapist and stuff. But, you know, a lot of the research actually shows that solitude can be a really good thing. Um, just not one of those things that you can only have. There's got to be interaction. Um, and so the course and the different researches have really shown me like, hey, well, and my treatment, it's really shown me like, hey, you've got to get out. You've got to do something. You've got to be in contact. I know that you might want to lay here in bed all day, um, you know, but call him up. Call your buddy up. Call her up. Um, you know, get out. You've got to do something. We have to have that um, social interaction. You know, the human mind and the hu body, human body craves it. It's how we function. It's how things get solved and people come together in the world. Um, but that's where I'm just on Rocky on this one because so I still love solitude to this day. I still like to just be able to relax by myself. Um, but I've definitely noticed myself remembering a lot of the things we learn and being like, all right, I've got to get out. I've got to change my environment. I've got to see other people um, just to really get in the right mindset. It's got to be a really good, healthy mix. Um, but so I, I came into the class thinking that solitude was always the best option when clearly it, it's not, and I've had to learn it personally. Um, the last implicit bias I really want to bring up is a very touchy one as well. Um, 
it is that we're taught as young kids that men who reach out or show emotion are weak, um, and it jeopardizes your masculinity, and that it's just not good to show emotion, which is also something I had to deal with, with seeing all the stuff that my dad was going through as a kid. Um, a, I felt like I didn't really have anybody to tell because he had enough going on on his plate. And then B, I had that stigma of if you show this emotion, you know, you're you're doing something wrong or you're not a real man. Um, but, you know, in the research that we see here through Mission Harbor Behavioral Health, over 30% of men will experience a period of depression at some point during their lifetime. And about 9% of men report having feelings of depression or anxiety, anxiety every single day, um, which I can attest to. And one of the biggest keys in this is that we don't reach out so how are we supposed to know that other men are going through the same issues that we're going through, that you're not alone? I know that when I was first experiencing my stuff, um, my panic disorder, but back then I didn't know what it was. I was still on active duty, um, and it wound up making me get off active duty. I just didn't feel healthy or stable enough to you know, lead my soldiers. I was like, i got to take a step back to really figure out what's going on here. Um, but that stigma is, I'm glad to see it changing. Um, but this course also helped me realize and also the treatment and stuff and talking to other veterans and other men and stuff like that. Um, you know, we, we have to be emotional as men. You have to let things out. Otherwise, it's you're just a ticking time bomb until you explode. So I really still come into that, um, came into the course thinking, you know, like, you got to hold stuff in. Why do I need to make someone else upset or have to worry with my problems when, you know, I don't want somebody else to feel this way, so why would I put these problems onto somebody else? And I think that's the worst stigma that we can have as a community as a whole. Um, you know, there's, you've got to be able to reach out. You've got to talk to people, and I think that's the biggest key that, you know, I'll tell people all the time we'll be in a social scenario, and I'll be like, I cry. Um I have issues, and it took me a long time to get out of that. It's just one of those things that you're not really going to do unless it's taught to you from a young age that it's okay, or you, until you hit your breaking point and somebody makes you go or forces you to go. Um, but this class definitely helped me learn that you know there, you don't have to be alone. It's okay to break down and to be um, vulnerable, really. Um, because if you're holding it all in, it's just a matter of time until you're going to explode and, you know, something worse could happen. But I think this class definitely helped me break that stigma and to take that implicit bias out of me, um, showing me that it is okay to open up and it's okay to, you know, venture out into the world, reach out for help, look for other things. Um, but so... It feels good to change my beliefs a lot um, and to finally find the truth, not only just for the course, but, you know, it helps my mental health a lot, too. Um, one of my biggest breakthroughs was the VA could never diagnose me with anything, and I took a generalized psychology class last semester, um, and it taught me what panic disorder was, and I was finally able to be like, okay, I'm, exp I'm experiencing these symptoms. Um, vertigo was always one of the biggest things I couldn't understand of what I was feeling. I just felt dizzy. Um, so that's really what made me want to continue this minor being in psychology. And I just, I enjoy taking these courses because they help me understand myself more and the realization and the facts of not being alone. There's other things you can do and what I can do in the future of, you know, for my children, what I can do to change somebody else's life in the next generation. Um, and me still being in the military, I think this is, I'm going to be able to take away from this of, you know, I, my soldiers will have somebody that they can go to and talk to, and I'll be understanding of that. I'm not going to tell them, oh, you're crying? No, you don't have a reason for that. Man up and stuff like that. You know, I'll be able to take them into that room alone and be like, hey, man, talk to me. What's going on? Because um, I've probably been there. Um, so, but thank you for a good semester. I um, hope you have a great Christmas break. Thank you.